Today, by a, a rich providential coincidence, our gospel reading, I think, fits really well with our theme of, of one family. Because this story of the Magi that we know uh, brings an end to our Christmas season. Um, but it's all about unity in worship. Let me show you what I mean by that. The Bible says, in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Interestingly, we usually refer to the story as the story of the three kings, uh, when the Bible claims neither that there are three of them, nor that they are kings. Uh, the word that Matthew uses here is a magi, magi, which can mean uh, wizard, sorcerer. Uh, you can hear in the word magi our English word magic, right? The magi are religious figures, but they're not of the Hebrew faith. Likely from Persia, these uh, sorcerers were Gentiles, pagans. Uh, they were priests of a false religion, astrologers. These are the same kind of people that in Leviticus, the Bible says, do not turn to mediums or wizards, do not seek them out to be defiled by them. But here Israel does not seek them, they seek Israel, asking, where is your newborn king? And what makes them aware of Christ's arrival, but they say, we have seen his star. And we can't miss the significance of this. Here, a group of pagan priests, outsiders to the faith of Israel, they don't know the scriptures, but God uses what they do know to communicate to them. This is a perfect example of what we mean when we say that God meets people where they're at. God communicates with us in a way that we will understand. He speaks in the language of our culture. Now, we have a tendency, especially in Adventism, to get uh, really paranoid about things of pagan origin. You know what I'm talking about, right? People say, oh, that comes from this or that comes from that. Uh, especially, you know, when it comes to music. I remember reading books in, in uh, high school being told that uh, any use of drums in worship is like African witchcraft or something like that, right? So we have this tendency to say, oh, that's not, that's not what God uses. That's something other. That's, that's pagan. That's Gentile. But the point of all of these, I think, kind of conspiracy theories is that we're trying to box God in. We're trying to figure God out so that we can say, God speaks to us in this way. God prefers this kind of music. God only speaks to us in a way that I want him to speak. But what our gospel is telling us this morning is that God speaks to us in the most surprising ways. In fact, the Bible shows us time and time again that God prefers to speak in ways that we don't think he can speak. The mediums or the avenues that we say God hates, that's what God will use. These magi, they were looking to the stars to try to find God. So God uses the stars to speak to them. And I can't help but think of Acts chapter 17, this one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament, where Paul is visiting Athens. And he sees in Athens all of their uh, pagan religion. He sees their statues, their altars, their rituals. And what you might expect is for Paul to condemn their idolatry and their wickedness. But instead, he stands up to speak to them and he gives them words of affirmation. He says, people of Athens, I see that you are most religious in every way. And rather than introducing Jesus Christ as a rival to their religion, he incorporates himself and his message into the worldview that they already have. And he says, I noticed that you have an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And this was consistently Paul's method of evangelization. He met people where they were at. He didn't compromise his message, but we have to be careful to distinguish between the message and the medium in which that message is communicated. 
we have to distinguish between what is being said and how it's being said. Because Paul, the master evangelist, he adapts his presentation, he adapts his style to a new audience in order that the gospel might have a further reach. He says to the Corinthians, to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are without the law, I became as one who was without the law that I might win them. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles, understood this better than anyone else. Because what was revolutionary about Paul's message was that the Gentiles, these non-Jewish people, could become members of the church without having to become Jewish. And that's the most important part of the whole thing. That's what made Paul so radical. Gentiles being welcomed in, that wasn't new. That had been happening for centuries. But in order for the Gentiles to come in, they would say, sure, you can be one of us, as long as you dress like us, as long as you cut your hair like us, as long as you talk like us, as long as you worship like us. And what Paul is saying is that we can accept each other despite our differences. The great news of the gospel that we heard in today's reading from Ephesians is that the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We've all become members of one family, not because we're the same, and not because we all do the same thing, but precisely in our differences, we are united as one family. Now compare that, if you will, to the antagonist in our story, King Herod. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born, they told him, in Bethlehem. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time that the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. Herod, in this story, serves as a, an amazing contrast to the wise men, because here are these foreigners, uh, honest, sincere, almost naive, we might say, in their interactions, but Herod is cold and calculating. And he gives the appearance that he wants to worship the Messiah as well, but it's all a pretense. It's all for show. He doesn't really want to worship the newborn king. He wants to destroy him. And why? Because the wise men came and said, where is the one who's to be born king of the Jews? Well, see, king of the Jews, that's Herod's title. Herod is king of the Jews. The Roman Senate had appointed Herod as king of the Jews. So for someone to be born king of the Jews meant his power is being taken away. The next king of the Jews should be his own son, who will be a member of his family and carry on his name. So the message that comes from the wise men is a direct threat to him and to his power and his control and his family. So what a contrast between these wise men and their story. They represent Jews and Gentiles coming together as one family centered around true worship diverse, authentic. And on the other hand, we have Herod, who rather than wanting uh, to, to be part of this new and inclusive family, he works only to protect his own interests and maintain his control. So I think we have to decide this morning which of these characters we will be. Those who welcome the outsiders, those who are prepared to hear God speak in new and unexpected ways, or those who seek only to be in control and to have their power protected. The story continues, as you know, that the king sends them to Bethlehem, and they see the star as they had seen at its risings, and it stopped over the place where the child was. 
And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they knelt down and paid him homage. And opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return, they left for their own country by another road. This scene of the wise men and the young family of Jesus under one roof is a kind of symbol of the church. Because here in Bethlehem we find women and men, young and old, people from all different parts of the world with different cultural heritages, different customs and practices, but they were all gathered together there in that place for one purpose, to worship Jesus. And isn't that exactly what we do here this morning? Women and men, young and old, people from all different parts of the world with all different cultural heritages, different customs and practices, but we all come together for the same purpose, to worship Jesus, to give him our gifts. We each come to give our best to offer our talents, whatever those might be, to give back to God what he has given to us. And I love how this story ends because it says that the wise men returned to their own country. You see, the purpose of the church is not to come here and to stay here, but we're meant to go back. Go back to our homes, go back to our work, go back to our schools having been transformed by this encounter with Jesus, we go out to share that love with others. And having been brought together as one family, we go out to invite others to come and share in this fellowship with us. Amen.